Thank you, Zach and Becca. Well, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And you've probably noticed, as Alan mentioned, the abundant flowers at the cemeteries along with the flags. The flowers to honor those who died. The flags to remind us of why they died. In many military installations, there's the empty table with an empty chair, the glass turned over because they won't be drinking, uh, a white tablecloth to represent the purity of the motives of those who gave their lives, uh, a red rose representing the blood of their sacrifice, a candle to remember. And at three o'clock across America, there will be 60 seconds of silence. They chose when Congress passed this law in 2000 three o'clock, because that was the time when most Americans are out at parks with family, with friends, on lakes, celebrating the holiday, and it was chosen in the midst of their merriment, we want to remind them who they owe their freedoms. And we want them to pause and remember that freedom is not free, but those laid down their lives, and there are still men and women out there on lines to keep us free. And that's a sober thing that we need to take account of to appreciate what we enjoy. And this isn't intended only to remind us of those who died before, but to inspire us to be like them in our own conflicts in the future. This is how the bill reads from Congress. The federal government has a responsibility to raise awareness of and respect for the national heritage and to encourage citizens to dedicate themselves to the values and principles for which those heroes of the United States died. The point of remembering the dead is to encourage the living to imitate their brave devotion in future conflicts. The point of remembering the dead is to encourage the living to imitate their brave devotion in future conflicts. And that's our purpose this morning. As we want to remember the dead saints of old, the great heroes of the faith who laid down their life for the faith to inspire us to emulate their boldness for Christ in our own future conflicts to come. And so I invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, where we will be beginning in chapter 10, verse 32. Uh, We will be concluding in chapter 12, verse 3. This will not be a three-hour message. We will be moving in hop, skips, and jumps. But that is the unit. Because in this sermon, because that's what the book of Hebrews is, is it's not a letter per se. It is a written sermon written about 30 years after the death of Christ, to encourage Jewish believers outside of Rome to remain faithful to the faith despite the persecution that they were undergoing. And his basic point is, Jesus is better, don't go back. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood. The sacrifice of Jesus is better than the Old Testament sacrifices because the new covenant of Jesus is better than the old covenant. Don't go back. Don't fall away. If you remember when the crowds were in John 6 listening to Jesus and then he was talking about some hard teachings and they they fell away, they drifted. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, are you going to fall away also? He said, where would I go? (laughs) You have the words of eternal life. And he followed until the end. And when we come to verse 32 through 12, actually about verse 13, there's two main themes in this. Endure and have faith. Because it's our faith that inspires us to be faithful. And faithful even in the midst of persecution so that we endure to the end and receive our reward. We have need of endurance and we have need of faith. And we want to learn from those who have gone before to inspire and instruct us in both those things. Look in verse 32. But remember the former days, when after being enlightened to the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. You heard the gospel, you received the gospel, and immediately you were persecuted both by your Jewish community, your family, the synagogue that you were cast out of, as well as, as we'll see, the Roman community, because this was in the heart of the empire. And this persecution took a direct and an indirect form, it says in verse 33. Partly you suffered because you were made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. Uh, The word for public spectacle is the Greek verb theatrizo. (laughs) We have a thespian here. So we get our word uh, theater, of course. And it literally meant originally to put up on stage. 
So the cue comes, you enter in, and now you're up in stage for all the audience to see. But it became to be used figuratively to mean to make a spectacle of someone. So these Christians were shamed publicly. They were humiliated in front of the world. And this was both in verbal derision and in physical sufferings that they endured. And then secondly, it was partly because they became sharers with those who were so treated. Because some of their brothers and sisters in Christ were actually imprisoned for the faith, verse 34 tells us, they showed sympathy to them. They encouraged them, they brought food to them, they brought clothing for them, they, they brought money for them. And in identifying themselves with those who were incarcerated, they subjected themselves to persecution. Specifically, the seizure of their property. Because they would not give up on their friends, they confiscated their property, the Roman government did. And yet, they underwent this joyfully, it says. How? How can you have your home and your property seized joyfully? Because they knew that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. They knew that what was coming in the future was better than was offered right now. And they knew that it was going to be enduring under, unlike anything that they can enjoy right now. Uh, Jim Elliott, who gave his life bringing the gospel to the Alca Indians in Ecuador, said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. <laughs> and they rejoiced to do this, but they weren't going to give up on their Lord, and they weren't going to give up on their friends, and they weren't going to give up on their faith, even if that meant public derision, even if that meant physical suffering, even if that meant confiscation of property, because that has always been the Christian's law. I want to show you a correspondence from the historical record going back from a governor in what today would be northern Turkey named Pliny the Elder, written to the Emperor Trajan. One of the beautiful things about the Christian faith is this is not myth and legend. This is hard history based on archaeological data and proven facts. And so we have the Roman historian Suetonius and Tacitus telling us about Christianity and Christ. And we also have letters written from this governor in northern Turkey to the Roman emperor saying, what do I do about these Christians? I'm going to give you just a couple excerpts, first from the governor and then the emperor's response. In the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. And those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. In other words, will you renounce your faith? Will you swear to Caesar? Will you offer a sacrifice to the idol? And, and you can leave. You can go home. But those who persisted, I ordered executed. Why? What terrible deed did they do? Because I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. They were pig-headed. <laughs> they were unyielding. And that was grounds enough for me to take their life. Uh, he goes on to talk about how he tortured two deaconesses, two ladies, to find out more about this faith. There were many possessed of the same folly that were Roman citizens, and because they were Roman citizens, he didn't execute them, but sent them to Rome. You remember Paul, when he was being uh, tried in uh, Palestine, said, I appeal to Caesar, and being a Roman citizen, he was able to go to have the right to be brought to Rome where he died, being beheaded, unlike Peter, not being a Roman citizen. But then notice as he concludes this, why is he bothering the emperor with this minor matter? Because it wasn't minor. The matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, <clears throat> especially because of the number of people involved. This letter is written about 111 about to 114. 111 to 113 is the governorship of Pliny. Many persons of every age, young and old, of every rank, high and low, both sexes, male and female. And if I start cracking down on this, many people are going to be endangered. Because it's not only in the city, but it's gone out into the farmlands and into the villages. In other words, the gospel spreading like wildfire had gone to the city, had gone to the country, had gone to the farms, young and old, men and women, high and low. And if I crack down, O oh emperor, it's going to impact a lot of people. In fact, in his letter, he says, the temples are empty and the idle business and the ranches that provided sacrificial animals 
the economy is really hurting if you're in the idol business in northern <laughs> Turkey at this time because the gospel was spreading through the faithfulness of these Christians. <clears throat> the emperor writes back, You observed proper procedure, my dear Pliny, in sifting the cases of those who had been denounced to you as Christians. For it is not possible to lay down any general rule to serve as a kind of fixed standard, but they're not to be sought out. So don't beat on doors, don't seek them out. But if they are denounced and proved guilty, they should be punished, but with this reservation. Whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it, that is, by worshiping our gods, even though he was under suspicion in the past, shall obtain pardon through repentance. Because the Christians had a reputation that they would not deny Christ. They would not curse Christ. They would not say Caesar is Lord because they knew that Jesus was Lord. If they don't recant, kill them. But anonymously posted accusations ought to have no place in any prosecution. Even back in the days of Rome, they knew that there needed to be some form of due process. And you don't take cowardly anonymous accusations that lynch mobs are a dangerous thing. For this is both a dangerous kind of precedent and out of keeping with the spirit of our age. Christianity has always been a persecuted reason, religion and it will always be a persecuted religion. And this should come as no surprise to us because Jesus had long before explained it and told us to anticipate it. In the Gospel of John chapter 3, he said, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. If you're involved in wickedness, you don't like righteous people to expose that. Even if they don't verbally say anything, it's an indictment against you. If you're the teetotaler, you're probably not invited to the spring break trip to Padre Island. Uh, I remember one time when I was in a business school at the University of Texas, and it was a group of students that we were able to take MBA classes, and in our final for our management class, um, we're sitting there in the business building at night, and one of the girls comes in and says, I've got the test. And I was able to get an advanced copy from an MBA class that took it earlier, and I made copies, and all we have to do is learn the answers, and we'll all ace it. And I excused myself from the room. Uh, I was one of two people that just said, I, I can't be party to this. I, I won't do it. And I didn't go tell the prof. I didn't announce him to the dean. We didn't turn him in. But I didn't care if I got a lower grade than they did. I wasn't going to compromise my integrity for the sake of an A. But they did. And they treated me differently after that. And they treated this other young lady differently after that. And it didn't matter that I didn't denounce them. My actions was a denunciation of them. And people don't like that. And so Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you were just like everybody else, everybody else would love you. But because you're not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember I told you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Because we identify ourselves with Christ. Because we imitate Christ. Because we share the teachings of Christ. And if they don't like Christ, they're not going to like Christians. And so 1 John says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Christians should expect to be persecuted. In Acts it says, After they, Paul and uh, Barnabas, had preached the gospel to that city, had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Peter said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. We have always been a persecuted religion. We will always be a persecuted religion because people don't like the message of the truth. It's no strange thing. It shouldn't shock or surprise us. We just need to be prepared for it. And the reality is persecution is not something simply of the past, of today, and not simply that's going on in the world, but increasingly in America, in Texas, and Denton, and it will be in Dinu. 
an organization called Open Doors does an annual report on the state of Christian persecution worldwide. In their 2019 update, there are 73 countries of the world in which Christians are heavily persecuted, which represents about 250 million people. Um, this Easter, while we were celebrating here, three suicide bombers blew up three churches in Sri Lanka, killed 250 and injured 500. Um, in Kenya, people would drive by in scooters on Sundays and throw grenades into churches who were worshiping. Um, I was trying to go to India in 2013. It was denied a visa because the nationalist government in India, in India is shutting down visas of anyone that has a Christian history in their background. Some dear friends of ours, this brother went from A&M to John Hopkins. He was on the teaching faculty at Southwest Medical Center. He moved his family to the poorest district in India in a place called Bihar, and he was evicted from the country, temporarily jailed, removed, because he was saving the lives of Indians that the government wasn't saving, because he had a Christian on his name. And this is going on around the world. It is also going on increasingly in America. Vanderbilt University has largely removed Christian organizations from its campus. Yale is under investigation, uh, Senate investigation, for discrimination against Christians in rights of college students. In California, a bill was passed that you cannot sell or publish literature that denounces an advocation of same-sex uh, tendencies, which would include the Bible, which would include most Christian books. And it's not just on the East and West in Texas. In 2014, the mayor of Houston tried to subpoena the sermons and correspondence of five pastors because she didn't like what they might have been saying in their sermons. Recently, earlier this year, San Antonio Airport, the San Antonio City Council banned Chick-fil-A from the airport. And there is now a Save Chick-fil-A bill going through the Texas House that should be soon up at Governor Abbott's uh, signature, trying to protect Christian organizations or those who donate to Christian organizations from discrimination and persecution economically. Here in Denton, we know people this semester who were openly ridiculed at local universities. It's not foreign to the world. It's not foreign to the past century. It's coming to America and it's coming to Texas. It's coming to Denton. It's coming for all of us and Jesus said it would. We shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be surprised. We do need to be prepared. Which is why as we move into the following verses, this isn't just of interest to those poor persecuted Christians of the past. We need this in preparation to walk faithfully with endurance today. So how did they do it? Look at Paul's words beginning in verse 35 of 10. Therefore, because of all this persecution, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance. Uh, the word for endurance has the idea of standing firm on a battlefield, of the bullets are flying, but the feet aren't, <laughs> because you're going to hold fast and you're going to man your post and you're going to stay even though it's costly. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what has been promised. Endurance produces obedience that results in a reward someday. Like Habakkuk said, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous ones shall live by faith. But the one who shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in them. But we, says the author of Hebrews, we're not like those who shrink back, but rather we are those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. And this is the context, this is the setup for one of the most famous chapters of the Bible, chapter 11 of Hebrews, which is sometimes called the Hall of Faith. This is a long recounting of the heroes and heroines of faith to inspire us to present faithfulness today. We're going to skim over it for the sake of time, but in verses 1 and 2 and then in 6, he describes faith and then talks about its indispensability to the Christian life. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, he's not talking about a blind faith that doesn't look at the evidence or hides its head from the evidence. Bright minds, educated, well-read individuals have investigated things thoroughly, and we believe this. But it's about remaining 
faithful to what we know is true, even when circumstances and emotions and temptations try to distract us from that. Here's how C.S. Lewis describes it in Mere Christianity. I was wrong in assuming <clears throat> that the human mind, once it accepts a thing as true, will keep on regarding, regarding it as true no matter what. I was assuming that human minds are completely ruled by reason. But that's not the case. For example, my reason is perfectly convinced by good evidence that anesthetics do not smother me and that properly trained surgeons do not start operating until I'm unconscious. But that doesn't alter the fact that when they've laid me down to the table, strapped me in, and clapped that horrible mask over my face, a childish panic begins inside me. I think I'm going to choke. I'm afraid that they're going to cut on me before I'm under. In other words, I lose my faith in anesthetics. <laughs> it's not reason that took away my faith. On the contrary, my faith is based on reason. It's my imagination, my emotions, my circumstances that is making my faith weak. The battle is between faith and reason on one side and emotion and imagination on the other. I'm not asking anyone to accept Christianity if their best reasoning tells them the weight of evidence is against it. That's not the point. But supposing a person is convinced that the preponderance of evidence says Christianity is true. I can tell you what's going to happen to him in a few days, weeks, months, or years. There will come a moment when there will be bad news, or he's in trouble, or surrounded by a lot of people who don't believe what he believes. And all at once his emotions will rise up and carry out a sort of blitz attack on his belief. Or there will come a moment when a man or woman wants to tell a lie, wants to do something wrong, sees a chance of making a little bit of money in a way that maybe isn't perfectly fair, and then in that moment of temptation it will be very convenient if Christianity were not true. <laughs> Haven't we found that? And once again, Wishes and desires and temptations rush on like a blitz. I'm not talking about new reasons against the faith. I'm talking about holding to the reasons that led us to the faith when temptations and persecutions and emotions and imaginations and circumstances tried to dissuade us. That's what it is to be convinced and assured of things that we don't see. Like, and now he's just going to walk us through the hall of fame of the Old Testament saints beginning with those that lived before the flood, like Abel, who offered a better sacrifice than his brother Cain, like Enoch, who walked with God in righteousness and therefore was caught up into heaven, like Noah, who built an ark when everybody thought it would have been absurd to have done so. Then he walks through the commendable faith of the patriarchs, of Abram, who left his homeland and all he possessed in his family to go to a place that he did not know simply because God told him to who wandered about because he was setting his hope on a city that God had planned for him and not for the city that he had left to gain it. By faith, he became the father of Ishmael and Isaac. And by faith, he was willing to offer up Isaac if the Lord requested it. Then Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau about the things to come. Jacob, a man of faith. Joseph, who said, don't leave my bones in Egypt when you leave looking far into the future because I want my bones brought into the promised land because I believe that God is going to fulfill what he promised and he promised that he would give us that land someday. Then there was the commendable faith during the exodus and the conquest of Moses who was hidden by his parents, of Moses who left the palace to side with the Hebrews. This is what the text says. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, a prince of Egypt, Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking to a better reward. Like Israel that marched around the city of Jericho until the walls fell. Like Rahab who threw in her lot with the Israelites because she believed that God was with his people. Time after time we see these Old Testament saints Remaining faithful because they believed and trusted God and they endured even when circumstances and hardships made that hard. Like in the time of the judges and the kings and the prophets, when men like Gideon 
Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. All of these men and women of faith who remained faithful even when it was hard to do so. And then we get a shift in verse 35. We get all of these wonderful triumphant stories of walls that fall down miraculously, of seas that part miraculously, of babies delivered when they're placed in baskets on the Nile, of people led through all kinds of unimaginable difficult circumstances and God delivered them all because He can, but He doesn't always. And so among this hall of faith are those who gave their life for their faith. Those who were tortured, not accepting their release. All they had to do was renounce God and they would have been freed from the pain of the torture. But they wouldn't deny Christ. So that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings, scourgings, chains, in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, which is how tradition tells us that the prophet Isaiah died. They were tempted, put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, and I love this line. If I ever get to write a book on church history, this is my title. Men and women of whom the world is not worthy. Isn't that a great line? <clears throat> Men and women of whom the world is not worthy. Because when you read the accounts of the martyrs, it's not just the heroic men and the great saintly ladies. It's the humble wives and moms. It's the laymen and the lay workers. It wasn't just the bishops and the priests. It was the laymen in the pews that were willing to sacrifice. Torture so gruesome that you can't even read them aloud publicly because of the imaginative efforts the Romans used to entertain the crowds by torturing these people publicly. And not with all of your people around you to support you and rally emotional support like on a battlefield, but individually separated from your family, alone in an arena. And the ranks of these heroes have only swelled through the centuries. I'm going to share you just a couple. In the middle of the second century, <clears throat> a man by the name of Polycarp was arrested in his home at the age of 86. And lying in his bed, the soldiers broke in because he was a bishop and they were rounding up the local heads of churches. And he asked the soldiers to please enjoy his hospitality and to enjoy his food and drink. And would they please give him an hour to pray? And they eventually led him into, aroma, into the arena where the crowds were shouting out for his death. Now, when I think of 86, I think of Mel at 93. But 86 was especially old in the second century. And we get this moving testimony of he bumps his shield, I mean his shin, coming down off the carriage that they transported him but he comes in they brought him forward and there was a great uproar when they heard that polycarp was there when he was brought in the proconsul asked if he was polycarp and when he confessed that he was he tried to persuade him to recant saying have respect for your age swear by caesar repent and say away with the atheists which is what christians were called because we wouldn't honor the roman gods and Polycarp looks around at the audience and says, away with the atheists. When the magistrate persisted and said, swear the oath and I'll release you. Revile Christ. Curse Christ. <clears throat> Polycarp says, for 86 years I have been his servant and he has done, now, done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saves me? The proconsul said, swear by Caesar. He says, you vainly suppose that I will swear by Caesar and pretend not to know who I am. I know who I am. I am a Christian. And if you want to know what a Christian is, give me a day and I'll give you a hearing. The proconsul said, I have wild beasts. They would constrain them and put them in front of animals, bulls, bears, lions. I will throw them to you unless you change your mind. Polycarp says, call for them. For the repentance from better to worse is a change impossible, but a noble thing to change from that which is evil is righteous, from that which is evil to righteousness. So I turn from bad to good when I convert it. I'm not going to reverse that process. He says, if you despise the wild beasts, I'll burn you alive. Polycarp said, 
You threaten me with a fire that burns only briefly and then is extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment, which is resolved, resolved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Do what you wish. And they set him afire, and then they stabbed him to death. And the accounts are legion of Stephen, who was stoned to death, praying for his killers to be forgiven. Of Paul, who suffered so greatly because he would not give up on the gospel. Where would we be if Paul had just simply done the simple thing and gone back home and been a great rabbi? And then later was beheaded. Of Peter, who was crucified upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. There's a story told of Peter in Rome when the persecution broke out under Nero. And Nero would light his garden parties by setting Christians aflame. And uh, the Christians, wanting to preserve Peter, got him out of the city to, to save his life, to spare him. And Peter had a vision, the story is told, of Christ walking on a road and entering into Rome. And Peter asked him, Quo audis, Domine? Where are you going, Lord? And he said, I'm going into the city to die since you will not die. And so Peter left and went in and was crucified upside down. And in the early 1900s, a Polish writer by the name of Henryk Sienkiewicz wrote a book called Quo Vadis that won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And it's just about the Christians under the time of the Neronian persecutions and what it was like to get a glimpse of life under that. All the way through our own heroes of Luther, who, when he was brought before the Holy Roman Emperor and all the cardinals and all the theologians and said, Luther, are these your books that they laid on your table? And he said, those are mine and I've written more. And they said, will you recant? He said, unless I am convinced by pure reason or by scripture, because I trust neither in popes nor councils because they have often contradicted themselves, I cannot and will not recant because to go against one's conscience is neither wise nor safe. Here I stand, God help me, amen. And he had signed his death warrant. Of William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English, and as he was betrayed by a friend and was being strangled to death, uh, his dying words were, God opened the king of England's eyes, and he died praying for the man who had hired the man to kill him. All the way through to Jim Elliott, who gave his life on a beach in Ecuador, to his wife Elizabeth, who moved her young children as a widow into the tribe of the people who had killed her husband so that she could bring the gospel to them. And to all the saints through the centuries who are still out there suffering, who are still out there laboring. And we are part of a noble tradition and an honorable faith. And there are heroes and heroines in our past and today who exhort us, don't give in, don't give up, don't yield, stay true, stand firm, like Christ did. Look how the chapter ends. Verses 39 to 40. Oh, I, I, I skip over one thing, but I'll just bring this up. Um, in Acts 12, we have an interesting account. The first is familiar, the less is second so. In verses 6, it says, On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains. Guards in front of the door were watching over the prison, and behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, struck Peter's side, woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself, put on your sandals. And he did. Then the angel said, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know what was being done. He didn't know if it was real. It seemed like he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out alone into the street, and the angel departed. And it's another heroic testimony of the ability of God to deliver miraculously, right? But notice how chapter 12 starts. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. Who was more faithful, Peter or James? They both were. Sometimes God can miraculously spare and deliver. Sometimes God allows us to endure and die. We just have to be faithful whatever our fate may be because the Lord is the one who directs our steps and sets our path but we don't know what it's going to be. 
But moving to verse 39 on some lessons from the faithful. And all of these, meaning these heroes of the faith in chapter 11, some delivered, some not, having gained approval from God through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Moses never entered into the promised land. Abraham never saw the great city that God was preparing for them. All the victory of the Messiah that many of the prophets were anticipating was all future. They never saw it. Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect or their number complete. So we see that God approves of those who trust Him, who have faith in Him, and therefore remain faithful. It's interesting, the Greek word for faith and faithful is the same word. It's pistis. And so if you have faith, it's assumed that you'll be faithful. The Greek word for believe or to uh, have faith or to be faithful is the same, pistuo. Because if you truly believe, you'll truly remain faithful. It's just assumed there's a connection. And faith is required because our reward is future. Most of us won't see until the other side of our death the great glory that awaits us. We die in faith, trusting that God will fulfill His promises as He always had, as He always will, because God cannot deny Himself. That God's future reward is certain and better. Again, Jim Elliot's word, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. In comparison to Jesus' words, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but what? But forfeit your soul. If you could have it all, if you could have Buffett and Gates and Bezos combined, enjoy everything, indulge everything, gratify everything, for how long? And then your eternal soul stands before God. That's a bad trade. That's a bad deal. God delays our reward so that others may receive it too. There are people in the future that He wants to come to Him. So He's not come back yet because He's bringing others in. And therefore, endurance is required because it's a hostile world out there. The world hated Christ. It will hate Christians. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So, look how the text concludes. Therefore, in light of these heroes and heroines of the faith, in light of their endurance. Let us, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses of those surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We want to draw from these verses five lessons on how to run the race of faith with endurance, of how to remain faithful. First, to consider the cloud of witnesses who surround us. Uh, When you're in the British Army and you join the regiment, The regimental banners remind you of the centuries of history, of the legacy that you are now a part of, and that you honor that with your own deeds of bravery. If you go to a military academy and there's all these memorials of the heroes of the faith or the heroes of the country so that you too will be heroic when your time comes to defend your country, we have a great cloud of witnesses urging us on with their example. And if we could look into heaven, rallying us on with their encouragement. Uh, In 2009, in August, my wife said, I think I'm going to run a marathon. Now, my wife has been a runner for as long as I've known her, typically three miles, and she just got it into her head, I think I'm going to run, come December, the White Rock Marathon, 26.2 miles. I'm like, well, honey, I love you, I support you, but the first person who ran that race, it killed him. And so I don't know why anybody would want to do, the first guy that did it, it killed him, and, but she did this. So she began training and she began working and she got workout buddies and all the long runs. And then the day came for her to run the race with the race partners. Never run that far before. And my wife does not have a large stride. <laughs> but along the way, 
there's all of these people encouraging and exhorting them on. Tables of water, tables of the gel. And then my daughter, I forget what age at the time, 2009, you would have been nine, eight, in a cheerleading outfit with pom-poms. And every time she thought mommy was coming, she'd be there pom poming And a lot of times she missed mommy, but encouraged a lot of her other runners on the ricochet. And then as you get into that last stretch, all the other people have finished. It's not like, well, finish the race. I'm going to beat the crowd to Chewies. They linger at the finish line to encourage the others. You can do it. You can make it. It's worth it. You're not far now. Keep pushing on. Keep running. And the cloud of witnesses in, enables them to do what they would have lacked the ability to do on their own. And we, too, have a great cloud of witnesses, past and present. And we need to contribute to that with our own example. Secondly, the text tells us to lay aside every encumbrance and entangling sin. If you're going to run a long race with endurance, you've got to run light. You don't get to keep all of your sins and keep your faith. You don't get to indulge all of your appetites and get to live the life that God intends for us. We are intended to be holy. We're intended to be obedient. We're intended to live life as God instructs us. Um, last year, my brother and sister-in-law, Dave and Jen, celebrated their 25th anniversary. And to celebrate, they did a 10-day hike up Mont Blanc in Switzerland. So Jen, my sister-in-law, is a triathlete. Dave is a really good athlete. They're both high-fit people. But after one day in the Swiss Alps, there's no amount of walking in Denton that could prepare you <laughs> for ascending the Swiss Alps. And by the first time they got up there, they were beat. And when they go into the little shed that was going to house them that night, one of the persons says, you're never going to make it. Because <laughs> he says, you brought your house. They had overpacked. And they thought, well, I'm going to bring my Bible. I'm going to bring a book. I'm going to bring a journal. I'm going to bring a this. I'm going to bring my hibachi grill. I'm going to bring my what? So Dave had this pack. And the first person after the first day said, you're never going to make it. <laughs> and so they packed up everything that they could discard and someone brought it down to meet him at their hotel room nine days later because brother you're not going to make nine days in the alps packing a house you got to travel light and likewise in the christian life we are intended to remove the things that hinder us in our faith that obstruct us from our obedience that entangle us so that we get distracted so that we can run with endurance thirdly we fix our eyes on Jesus who died for us and is waiting for us. If you're a sprinter, what do they tell you to focus your eyes as you run? Straight down the lane, right? Just straight ahead. If you're swimming, you just look straight ahead. We are to fix our eyes contemplating Jesus who came from heaven to earth, took on human flesh, lived for us, died for us, rose for us, went to heaven, and now is awaiting us so that we can join him someday just like he did, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus was forward-looking to get through this. And we can't simply look at how bad it hurts. You can't simply look on how daunting it is, on how terrifying it is. You've got to look forward to the end. You've got to look forward to what lies on the other side of it. Uh, there was a movie that Ron Howard directed called Cinderella Man with uh, Russell Crowe, and it was about James J. Braddock, the Depression-era boxer who was a good fighter, and then he got out of fighting, and then somehow got back into fighting, and he ends up beating Max Baer to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And there's a scene in this movie where, on his way up to the championship fight, this larger, bigger, younger, more experienced opponent utterly clocks him. <laughs> and he just drops. And he hits the canvas, and the other fighter assumes he's got the knockout blow. And in Braddock's mind, we start getting flashbacks to his kids, hungry, of the apartment when there was no heat, of his wife distressed because they couldn't pay the utility bill. And he gets up, spits out the blood, puts in the mouthpiece, smiles, and goes back in to fight the opponent. And later on, when they were talking about, uh, how'd you do it? How, how do you keep pushing through? He said, I know what I'm fighting for this time. He said, what's that? He said, milk. 
I'm not fighting for fun. I'm not fighting for fame. I'm fighting to feed my kids because I knew what it was like when I couldn't feed my kids. And that image of what he was fighting for kept him going. He knew that he had to push on. So he did. We have to be forward looking. We have to fix our eyes on Christ if we're going to make this race. Fourthly, we don't run the race alone, but as a church. All of these imperatives, all of these commands, all of these verbs are plural. Y'all run. Y'all endure. Y'all fix. We're not going to make it alone. Do you know what a wolf calls a lone lamb? Button. <laughs> you don't make it alone. We do it as a family so that when someone is flagging, we go encourage them. When someone is falling behind, we go bring them ahead. When someone is strayed, we go after them because we've got to do this thing as a family. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to help one another because that's what a church is intended to be. And if people are struggling, we don't look down at them as though we're any better. We'll be struggling someday too. <laughs> if someone's falling behind, we don't get impatient. One day I'll be the one falling behind. But we do it as a family. We do it as a church. We do it as a community. And we look out for one another. There's an important book that came out a couple of years ago called The Benedict Option, written by a man named Rod Dreher. And Rod Dreher says, we have lost the culture war, if, if we ever won it. Uh, Christianity is no longer the predominant religion in America. And especially on the other, uh, the other side of the Supreme Court Obergefell decision, we are going to find ourselves increasingly in the minority and increasingly persecuted and they got rid of prayers, they got rid of Ten Commandments, now there's movements to remove in God we trust from the coins, to not make people say under God in the pledge, to remove crosses from national monuments. We are going to be culturally in the minority. We don't see it so much in Texas, but it is very much a part of the culture in other parts of the world, and it's coming here. And so he says, what we have to do is come together as a community. We're going to have to help one another. We're going to have to educate our kids. We're going to have to support. If a baker and a florist and a pharmacist can't get a job doing certain things because they're going to sue him for it, we have to support them with our business if they can no longer do weddings. If they can no longer sell an abortion pill as a pharmacist, then we have to help them out in another way of income. But we need to form these communities of faith, helping each other in our marriages, in our walks, in our parenting, in our jobs, in our livelihoods, in our faith, because we're only going to survive this thing as a community. And this isn't about circle the wagons and let the world do whatever it wants. This is for the sake of helping the world, of re-evangelizing the world. Because that's what happened when St. Benedict formed the first monasteries in Europe. Christianity became the predominant religion of the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire fell. And then civilization fell. And civilization was preserved in the monasteries. And not simply reading and writing and learning and the classical manuscripts, but also animal husbandry, agriculture, science. And pretty soon the Germanic tribes that didn't care one whit about Christianity, but noticed our animals are dying and yours are living. Our crops are failing and yours are thriving. How is it that you were able to predict this storm? How is it that you were able to cure this disease? And so the Christian said, let us show you. We're happy to help. And then Europe got re-evangelized re-Christianized. And that's what we're going to need to do again. Um, how come you and your wife seem to love each other after 25 years? Well, it's hard. I'm a sinner, she's a sinner. But we love Jesus, and Jesus enables us and teaches us. How come your kids aren't rambunctious and rebellious? Well, they often are. You just caught them on a good day. But God tells us how to raise our kids, and if we do it God's way, it's the right way. And so how come, how come, how come? Happy to help. Happy to show you. I'm still learning, but at least i got a guide. And that's the role that we're intended to play. But the day of individualistic, isolated Christians needs to be over. It was never acceptable to God. We were always intended to be a family, always intended to be a community. Just as Americans, we love number one. We like individualism. That was never intended to be an option. And increasingly, it won't be an option if we're going to run our race together with endurance. Finally, don't grow weary or lose heart, but endure. Endure. You know, when we think about persecution, you often think of two categories. There's the miraculous deliverance, and then there's the martyrdom. 
But for most Christians in most days and most circumstances, you just got to endure. You got to keep showing up. You got to keep standing firm. You got to be unyielding. I'm going to be loving but truthful. I'm never going to be harsh or hateful. I'll always be respectful, but I'll tell you what God's Word says because I love you too much not to. You can choose to do with that what you will or won't. That's between you and God. For my part, I have to obey Him and I have to encourage you to obey Him. And I can't be silenced on that point. Endure. Stand fast. Remain true. You know, we admire endurance in so many different categories. Um, the book Unbroken, or maybe you saw the movie, that dude wouldn't give up. Uh, what was the great thing about Rocky? He just wouldn't stay down. You remember Mickey? Get up, you son of a gun, because Mickey loves you. And he always would. You never could keep Rocky down. No one got knocked down more or got up more. Especially in Texas. You know, we on our trucks come and take it. You can, pry, you can have my Bible when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. <laughs> or one of my favorite sayings, uh, the Texas Rangers, their slogan. Anyone know it? You can't stop a good man in the right who keeps it coming. Isn't that great? Now, you may slay a bunch of us here and there, but you can't stop a good person in the right if they keep it coming. And we're going to keep it coming. You can't make me hate you. You can't make me be hateful towards you. But I'm going to keep it coming unless God puts me in the ground and I come home. And that's okay too. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So this Memorial Day, as you see the flags and the flowers, as maybe you see a mess hall with an empty table, as you pause for 60 seconds, yes, remember, the men and women who gave their lives. 1.8 million servicemen have been lost in the fighting since 1775. But also remember our own heroes of the faith, our own cloud of witnesses, our own battle. And keep the faith. Don't give up. Stand firm. Stay true. Endure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text because we need it. And the reality is we all have a prosperity gospel. <laughs> we all assume that if we're mostly nice people and we mostly believe in you and we try to obey most times, the things are going to turn out pretty good for us. But that's not what Scripture teaches. You tell us you will give us food, clothing, shelter. You tell us that we have an eternal home where there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. But you promise us that we will be persecuted. And then you promise to reward us. Blessed are you when men persecute you, said Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And speak evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, because in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were ahead of you. Blessed are those who have been persecuted, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Our kingdom is not of this world, it's coming. Our reward is not in this life, it's coming. Our hope is not in this life, it's coming. So keep us faithful. Give us the grace to endure. And we'll ask this in Jesus' name, amen.